Welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church's Easter service for March 31st, 2024. A couple of brief announcements before we begin. Uh, first, this Friday, April 5th, we will have our prayer shawl committee meeting at 10 a.m. in the morning. And then on the 6th, we will have our next workday at 8 a.m. in the morning. And of course, Sunday, we'll have our regular services at 8.30 and 10 o'clock a.m. The following Tuesday, the 9th, we will also have our sunshine class meeting at 12 noon. Finally, may you have a very blessed Easter as we celebrate the hope, joy, and mystery of the resurrection. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, his mercy has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As I called and ordained to minister the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you gave your only Son to suffer death on the cross for our redemption. And by his glorious resurrection, you delivered us from the power of sin and death. Make us die every day to sin, that we may live with him forever in the joy of the resurrection. For your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Acts, the 10th chapter. Then Peter began to speak to the people, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to satisfy that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. God's mercy endures forever. Let Israel now declare... God's mercy endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song, and has become my salvation. Shouts of rejoicing and salvation echo in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord acts valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord acts valiantly. I shall not die but live, and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord indeed punished me sorely, but did not hand me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. Here the righteous may enter. I give thanks to you, for you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. By the Lord this has been done. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Here ends the psalm. Now we have special music by Kate and Mighty Mike Steet, Because He Lives. 
Our second reading is from St. Paul's letter to the Church to the Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Now I remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaimed to you, which you in turn received, in which you also stand, through which you also are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaimed to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you, as of first importance, what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and they was buried, and they was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Here ends our first reading. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. 
he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been in Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she went over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and saw and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told him that he had said these things to her. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may have missed this in the news of the spring of 2023. The Roman Colosseum was demolished by bulldozers. Yes, demolished by bulldozers. Along with the temple, the upper room, and the empty tomb. Thank God the tomb was empty, so no one was hurt. No, I'm not crazy. The Colosseum that I'm talking about is not the one in Rome. The temple, the upper room, and the empty tomb are not the ones in Jerusalem. They were demolished thousands of years ago. I'm talking about the ones that were located in the Holy Land Experience, which opened in 2001. This was no bathroom biblical drama. It was designed by Orlando-based ITEC, which worked on nearby projects like Disney's Mission Space and Universal Studios' Spider-Man Experience. The management of the Holy Land Experience made it clear that they are not a theme park like the others around them in Orlando. There were no rides, for example. Then they preferred to refer to the park as a living biblical museum where people do indeed encounter the particular spiritual theme that Jesus Christ is Lord. In other words, this isn't Disney World, and Jesus is not Mickey Mouse. The disciples, townsfolk, and Roman soldiers in the Holy Land experience are there to interact with the visitors and mug for all those digital cameras, but they do so as living historians. They act in the first person and must know all the details about life in first century Israel. Jesus, on the other hand, would retreat behind the scenes after a morning show called the Ministry of Jesus, reappearing again only once in the afternoon as he drags the cross down the faux Dia Valorosa, while actors portraying Roman soldiers appear to kick and spit on him. Tourists line the streets taking pictures, some licking the milk and honey ice cream cones they bought from a nearby concession stand. The action then moves to the Calvary's garden tomb, area of the park where it is Jesus is nailed to a large cross that is lifted up by hydraulic motors. Later, he appears in the tomb that sits immediately below Calvary's Hill. This might not be your chalice of wine, but to be sure, because the whole thing may appear from a distance as a cheesy Easter pageant going Hollywood. Of course, the point was to connect with our modern day experience, need to experience things in person. Since we can't travel back into time to witness the death and resurrection of Jesus, The Holy and the Experience recreates the drama in order for us to move us, who see it to somehow relate to the visceral story as it unfolds before our eyes. Unfortunately, after a 20 year run, the Holy Land Experience had to close due to lack of enough visitors. Maybe they should have included a few rides by the design. Hmm. Here at Trinity, we have no hydraulic crosses, no scale model tombs, no faux Jesus to be crucified and resurrected on a daily schedule, But I, along with every other pastor who stood in this pulpit on Easter Sunday, have done our best to give the congregation an opportunity to experience the events of that morning. We've worked hard to recreate the scene and our sermons, make sure that the music and the mood are right, and then we open the doors to the hordes of people who fill the pews for that one Sunday a year. Many of these folks looking for a seat, however, are kind of spiritual tourists. They drop in, look on, have a pleasant experience, but then it's off to brunch. 
For them, the resurrection is the greatest comeback story of all time, but when confined to the time and space of Easter itself. Oh, they'll look back at Christmas for another play, another pageant, but otherwise it's all a nice memory. But if people treat Easter like a tourist attraction, maybe that's because we in the church haven't done enough to point out the real message of Easter as an ongoing reality that continues beyond the historical event. The resurrection of Easter marked the triumph of God over evil and death, but also marked a fundamental change in the relationship between God and humanity. It signals a reconciliation. We have peace, Paul writes in the Romans, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The empty tomb means that, as Jesus is, we also can be, selfless agents of love and reconciliation. The resurrection story in John 20 is a familiar one. Mary Magdalene discovering the empty tomb, Peter and John seeing the folded grave clothes, the visit of the angels, the risen Jesus calling Mary's name. These are the stories the crowd gathers to hear Easter morning. What we sometimes miss, though, is that the real thrust of the message points towards the ascension of Jesus as the decisive event that will activate and empower his disciples. Mary moved to embrace the risen Jesus, but he said, Do not hold on to me, because he had not yet ascended to the Father. It's not that Jesus had some kind of dangerous spiritual aura about him, or that his resurrected body could not be touched by human hands. Mary wanted to hold on tight to her teacher and Lord, but Jesus reminded her of that bigger picture. The focus of Jesus was not on basking in the glow of the resurrection event, but in getting word to the disciples and getting them moving out on the mission of taking the message of the risen Christ into the world. In St. John's Gospel, it's the ascension of Jesus that will empower the disciples and enable, enable the mission to move forward. Notice the message that Jesus instructs Mary to carry on to the disciples. It's not about giving them a meaning point for the post-resurrection appearance, but instead it's a message about his ascension which John sees as the completion of Jesus' glorification and his identity as the true Son of Man. The ascension was a fulfillment of the promise that Jesus would be prepared a place for those he loves. That place has most often been equated with a faraway and future heaven, but the context here seems to be grounded more in the present. The image of the Father's house in John's Gospel is used to describe the nature of a divine human relationship as well as a physical location. The place that Jesus was preparing and making possible in the ascension then was not so much a heavenly mansion, but rather a new relationship, a new house, where the followers of Jesus would enjoy the same indwelling relationship with God in the present that Jesus had enjoyed. Jesus' return to God would be the event that made it possible for the disciples to join in the relationship shared by Jesus and God the Father. What was true about that relationship between Jesus and God my Father and my God, would now be true of the disciples, your Father, your God. As if to signify this change in relationship, Jesus instructs Mary to bring the news to my brothers. The disciples, both male and female, were to be the new family of God and the representatives of Christ in the whole world. When Jesus appeared to his disciples for the first time, he confirmed that mission. As the Father sent me, so I send you, he says. So here's the deal for our Easter crowd today. The glory of Easter, the glory of Jesus, was to be acted out by disciples. The disciples are to be Jesus' hands, feet, and voice, serving people everywhere. For us 21st century disciples, being Jesus isn't about beards, robes, six-pack abs, and twice daily shows, but it's about walking the talk, dying, being raised, and being in relationship with God, whom Jesus called Father. Walking the talk. Being Jesus every day means that as Jesus walked among the people of his day, showing his mercy, healing the sick, interacting with others, with respect and love, we too get to live in a world walking the talk, making a difference, healing the wounded, binding up the broken, blessing those around us, and lifting up the fallen. We get to do that. Dying daily. We may not get to be crucified on a hydraulic cross six times a week, but we do die to an old life, and chances are we go through a good crucifixion every day. The Apostle Paul said that he died daily. What makes us think we can go get off with any less? Dying daily means that there, there are bound to be those moments when our natural, base, selfish interests rear up, kind of like Glenn Close in the bathtub scene of fatal attraction, refusing to die. Being Jesus means we go through a dying. We say no to those selfish interests as we put the needs of others first. Tough to do so. 
painful. No one said the crucifixion would be easy. Buried. Being Jesus means we may feel like we're, we've been buried and forgotten. We live faithfully and no one notices, no one cares. People throw a few daisies our way and move on. Big deal. Resurrection. Being Jesus means that the power of God energizes afresh each day and each moment of the day. We're alive to a new life and we're alive with a new life. Easter morning is our reminder that we're called to be Jesus. And not only called, but empowered to be what we've been called to be. This call cannot be made with reference to any other person. We can't make this a sermon about being Warren Buffet, or being the Apostle Paul, or being Mother Teresa. It's not about giving away $50 billion, writing theological essays, or working in the slums of Kolkata. Being Jesus is much more. It's about recognizing our new relationship to God as a child of God, reconciled to God through Jesus. A turn of events that allows us not to just not act apart, but to live the life day after day. Richard Beck is Associate Professor of Psychology at Abilene Christian University, and he has a lot of experience playing the part of Jesus in Passion Place. He's ha- here's the advice for those of us who want to be like Jesus. The key to playing Jesus isn't to be different. The key is be yourself. The point is this. You are never closer to being Christ-like than when you are at your best. Think of yourself when you're feeling compassionate, generous, or merciful, and act like that. Being the image of Christ isn't hard, it's just being you. A pastor once told his adult Sunday school class the following, When you're at your best, not even Jesus could do better. They look startled. Why? Because we tend to think that Jesus is bringing to the human condition encounter some special Jesus ingredients that we mere mortals just do not have. But most of the things we're called to do are mundane and straightforward. Do them. Do them well. And not even Jesus could perform them better. You don't need to be the incarnate God to give a thirsty person a cup of cold water. Just give them a cup of cold water. It's not magical. If someone needs a kind word, then speak a kind word. It's not rocket science. If someone needs forgiveness, then say, I forgive you. It's not superhuman. Being Jesus in my estimation, is easy. So I don't think we do people favors by making being the image of Christ something only super spiritual saints are capable of. Sometimes being Jesus is just listening over coffee. The point is, for large parts of the day, you are being just like Jesus. We need to recognize and own those moments so that we can leverage them into the more difficult areas of spiritual formation. True, there are aspects of being Jesus that are very hard. Loving enemies comes to mind. So I'm simplifying here, but my point is simply this. If you want to be like Jesus, don't try to be different. Be yourself. Well, thank you for that information, Richard Beck, because you're exactly right. Jonathan Rumi, who is the actor who portrays Jesus in the Chosen series, most people who I talk to think that he might be the best Jesus ever. There seems to be some kind of quality that he has that you almost believe he truly is Jesus. When he's not portraying Jesus in Chosen, He can be found online and in person encouraging people to pray. He can be found spending time with fans, sharing his easy spirit and care for those who have found some peace in viewing The Chosen. In a New York Times article from April 2, 2023, Rumi said regarding the challenges of portraying Jesus Christ, Very often I don't feel worthy of playing Jesus. I struggle with it a lot. But I also acknowledge what God has done for my life as a result of playing Christ and how God has changed my life. Maybe his gentle and loving personality shines through when he's playing Jesus in a way that he is not playing a part at all. He's just being his true self, and that's why he makes such a great Jesus. Imagine what improvements, of group, what improvements a group of people who visibly look nothing like Jesus could make if they simply chose to act like him. Serving humbly, speaking passionately, living generously, doing justly, and experiencing the elevated life of Christ. Well, that is the Jesus experience, and it can turn spiritual tourists into transformed people who are transforming the world. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now we have special music from Bob Kramer and Harry Avell. He lives.
give our offering. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious God, as we celebrate new life in the resurrection, Make your church courageous in its witness and bold in its proclamation so that those who live in the shadow of death may see the light of Christ. God of justice, grant local and national leaders wisdom to govern in hum with humility and grace, ensuring the security and dignity of all people in their care. Faithful God, you call us to life and resurrection of your Son. Grant all the baptized grace to walk forth as your faithful people and be bold witnesses in the world. God of might, Protect all who work upon the sea. Bring an end to piracy and protect all who fall into the hands of evil. For an end to the hate crimes and violent attacks against others. Bring calm, peace, and understanding to those who vent their angers and frustration on those who are innocent of any wrongdoing. Bring an end to the death, destruction, and suffering in the Middle East. Help us to find a way to bring peace and understanding among those who bring violence to others. Send your spirit to the people of Ukraine and guide the Russian government into a peaceful resolution to this conflict. Give continued guidance to President Biden and his advisors during these difficult times. We continue to pray for the safety as troops are deployed throughout the world, especially for those who are known to us, Andre Flamini, Jordan Wilson, Lily Kramer, and Noah Horton. God of all consolation, you comforted Mary Magdalene at the tomb by making known to her the risen Christ. Comfort all who grieve and who are ill, especially those we now name in our hearts and out loud. God of healing power, we pray for anyone having trouble with their heart. 
Create in them a new heart and renew a right spirit within them. Through your indwelling Holy Spirit, flow through the valves and arteries, removing any blockage, anything that would hinder your healing touch. Heal any damage to the heart and any part of the body affected by the heart disease, and grant your healing and wholeness. Allow the heart to be made whole, in Jesus' name. Eternal source of peace, as you raised your Son on the third day, so raise us on the last day, to live in the glory of Christ with you, all the saints, for whom we praise you today. In your hands, O Lord, you commend all whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen.